Mm-hmm. Hey guys, uh, welcome back to the YouTube channel. Today I am joined by Dr. James Booth. Um, he is a professor here at Cornell University in the Department of Statistics. He's a very successful professor and also uh, he is the director of our uh, graduate studies here. So he kind of manages all of the, the PhD level stuff. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Booth did his Bachelor's of Math at the University of Leeds um, in, in England and then he came to the United States uh, at the University of Kentucky and completed his PhD in statistics in 1987. And then he's been with us at Cornell. I mean, he did spend some time at the University of Florida, and then now right. he's with us at Cornell University, and this is your 20th or 21st year, I think. That's right, yeah, I started in 2000. And I came in 2003, but I wasn't hired full-time until 2004. Okay, great, mm -hmm. great. So yes, uh, today I'm joined by Dr. Jim Booth, as I mentioned, and let's get started. Uh, so, as I mentioned, he's a professor here in the Department of Statistics. So, uh, Dr. Booth, could you tell us a little bit about your educational background and your journey to become, uh, to pursue, pursue this career in statistics? Yeah, so uh, I think you mentioned I was an undergraduate at the University of Leeds in England. I was a mathematics major. Um, the way the major was structured, um, we all the all the majors took all the math majors took the same classes in the first year and mostly the same classes in the second year or, although I think we had some choice and then the third year we were allowed to um, it was a three year degree program the third year we, we were able to branch out a bit I and that's when I uh, took quite a few um, advanced statistics courses and um, I think I'd taken maybe one or two. Uh, basic statistics courses in in my second year and like a probability class and um, one memory I have of that is we had a an American uh, professor called John Kent mm -hmm. and um, he uh, he was talking about the Poisson distribution and the example he gave was um, the number of chips in a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> And you have to remember, this was in England, so oh, we didn't know what a chocolate chip <laughs> cookie. We didn't know what a cookie was, but a chocolate chip. Cookie. Um, so that was pretty funny, but I never forgot that. Um, yeah, and then I, after I I applied for a, a one year master's program, which was also at Leeds University, and I I did that, um, and I had a roommate. Uh, you know, we lived in a, a house with four or five other students. And one of my roommates was applying to um, PhD programs all over, all over Europe and all over the United States. And that had never occurred to me. He wasn't in statistics, he was in physics or something. He ended up going to um, CERN in Grenoble. Okay. Um, but he was admitted to Harvard and various other places. So I decided, well, you know, why not? I'll apply to some places in the US too. Mm -hmm. Remember, this was all pre-internet, uh -huh. so we had to go to the library and pull out a big, thick book that told you, where they had instructions on how to apply to uh, different universities around the world. Mm. And um, I applied to three American universities, um, the University of Kentucky, um, I, I'll come back to that in a moment, that was one of them, uh, Florida State University and Cornell. Mm. And I got into Kentucky and Florida State, but I didn't get into Cornell, oh. um, which was interesting. <laughs> but um, yeah, so why did I go to Kentucky? Well, um, the chair of the department at the time there was called Joe Garney, and he was a pretty well-known applied probabilist, and he'd been chair of a department in Sheffield in England um, so he was well known to some of the faculty that I knew at Leeds mm -hmm. University, and so they they recommended him. That's that was the reason I applied there. Um, what else? So so yeah, I did a, I did my PhD. My PhD was mostly kind of stochastic processes, applied stochastic processes. Um, I didn't really know much about applied statistics, like 
multiple linear regression and that kind of stuff when I went when I got my first job at the University of Florida and <coughs> I uh, I actually learned that when I had to teach it oh. so I had to teach you know intro stats in second semester um, applied statistics courses and that's when I learned oh, I see. basic statistics you know. So when was that? That's the, you said University of Florida, right? Yeah. So this was maybe around 2003 or... No, 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 no. I'm much older than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went there in 1987. Okay, 87. And then yeah. uh, you left, uh, you came here in, in 2003. 2003. I yeah. see. And now that's your bread and butter, right? This linear models um, mm -hmm. type, you know, yeah. everything to do with linear models, I think, is mm -hmm. and um, random effects type stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. Um, and... So in that progression, so it seems like, as you mentioned, you, when you were in school, you felt like maybe you'd, you learned a lot on the way, and then now mm -hmm. you're doing things that you probably couldn't even imagine at, at that point, at the very beginning. Um, so have you had any kind of ups and downs where you felt like maybe this is a very difficult path, or maybe this is not for me, or maybe you had some really great moments where you decided that, yes, this is exactly what I want to do uh, for my career? Um, well, there are definitely ups and downs, as you know, anyone who goes into academia finds out when they try and publish, you know, <laughs> and, you, um, and you get referee reports that are really negative, and sometimes you, they're really positive and you, you love it, but um, I, um, I, I would say one mistake that I've made in my career is that I haven't been focused enough in, in one particular area. So I've worked on a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, a, you know, it's nice in some ways, but it's, it's, it's not a good thing for somebody just starting out as an assistant professor to do. Don't try and be really broad. Try just be, focus on, on a, you know, a particular area and become an expert in that. After you've been <laughs> promoted, you can move on to other things. But. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what are some of the, do you have any kind of favorite memories from your time at, maybe while you're doing your PhD in Kentucky? What I really liked about it was how international the uh, graduate student body was. So I used to play a lot of soccer. Um, and at the time I came to the States, um, the, there weren't very many good soccer players, to be quite honest. Most kids, who, if they played soccer, had only learned to play it when they were in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I joined a team. Actually, it, it turns out that this is how I met my wife, actually. And cool. I joined a soccer team in Kentucky, and I had a couple of Argentinian friends who were also graduate students. And we all joined the team at the same time, and they went from being the worst team in the league to being the best team in the league in one year. It was quite wow. interesting. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, so that was fun. Um, yeah, and, and one thing I've tried to do as director of graduate studies here at Cornell is to kind of keep that international flavor and um, try, I've tried to attract students from a variety of different countries. And you mentioned that, so was your wife uh, on the same team, or was she a spectator? She was on the same team, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. So you guys met at the University of Kentucky? Uh, kind of. Uh, it, actually, we met on the soccer field of uh, Transylvania University, which is a small oh. private college in, oh. in Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And then, so moving on, you were a, an assistant professor at the University of Florida for some time, I guess over a decade, I think, um, maybe around that, around a decade. Uh, I went through the kind of normal um, progression, so I think I was promoted after about six years. Six years. Then. And then I was promoted to full professor, I think, in 2000. Okay. Um, one, one thing I did that was is quite different from most uh, academics is that I did a postdoc, but it was after I had been at the University of Florida for three years. Oh. And I applied, it, it was 
it was called a research fellow position, but it was effectively a postdoc at mm -hmm. um, the Australian National University. I see. And I worked with a famous um, mathematical statistician called Peter Hall. Mm, yes. Um, and that was a that was a fantastic experience, and it it really boosted my career. Mm -hmm. And this is also a question that's kind of relevant to me as well. I mean, I still have some time before finishing my PhD even, but do you recommend that people do, so you mentioned that you spent three years in the academic you know, job environment and then you went to do a postdoc at the Australian National University. Would you recommend that graduates, if they want to go into academia and statistics, do a one or two year postdoc? Um, well, I'm thinking of the, the most recent faculty that we've hired at Cornell. Um, in this department, so <coughs> the last five people we've hired all did postdocs. I see. So um, that suggests that it does give you a leg up in the in in the um, job market. In the job market. Having said that, um, I have had students who have gone directly into assistant professor positions and have done very well. Mm -hmm. And then, so after you did your postdoc, you spent you know a, a little bit more time at the University of Florida, um, attained you know tenure, and then mm -hmm. became full professor. And then, what was that transition from the University of Florida to Cornell University like for you? And when did you, when and how did you decide that you wanted to to move and make a change? Um, So I, I actually came to Cornell on a sabbatical leave for a year, and um, the and then I applied for a job in what was biological statistics and computational biology, and um, there are a number of factors. But I had I have three children; they were in uh, school at various stages, um, and you know it. it it worked out well for them. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you might think moving your kids across the country to a different school system is, isn't a good thing, but it, 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 <coughs> it, it worked out well for them. And, um, and the other, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, the other factor is that Cornell was willing to pay me a lot more money, you know, that was, right. but, you know, we'd been, after we'd been here a year, we really loved it. We loved it again, and so. It was an easy decision. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Um, and then, I guess you've been researching all throughout your career. Maybe you you said you've been kind of broad at the beginning, and maybe you've kind of found your passion and your bread and butter sort of things for research. Uh, what it's what are some of the most kind of more memorable research projects that you've worked on that are kind of you have fond memories of, or if any, I know research can be really difficult and maybe frustrating at times, but. Any, any ones that stand out to you? Um, <coughs> I have one paper, um, the one that's the most highly cited, um, has to do with um, using a, a Monte Carlo EM algorithm to fit generalized linear mixed models. Um, and um, that was a fun paper to work on. Um, I did that jointly with um, a former colleague at the University of Florida. And so the, the problem with generalized linear mixed models is uh, un unlike in the normal case, in order to get the likelihood function, you, ha you have to integrate out the, the random effects over the random effects distribution. In the normal theory case, there's a, a closed form expression for that. But in the generalized linear model course case, there isn't. And so there was a lot of work early on um, when people were first discussing these models on how do you do the integral. And so, um, so it was really a computational issue. Um, and, you know, I could, one of the things that's happened in my career is I, we've gone from very kind of limited computational capabilities, you know, pre-internet, 
pre-email um, to you know the, the, the phenomenal computational um, capabilities we have now. And so this was in that, that, that kind of transition period where people didn't know how to do these computations. And so we came up with a, a way to do it that involved Monte Carlo, a Monte Carlo strategy. But the thing about Monte Carlo is you're, you're essentially introducing noise into the system. And so if you want to um, come up with the correct answer, you have to increase the Monte Carlo effort as you get closer and closer to the correct solution. So we had a, an algorithm for doing that. Huh. I doubt that anyone uses it anymore because computing capabilities have, have improved so much that um, you know they have other ways, better ways to do it nowadays. But um, I have another similar. I, I spent quite a bit of time working on bootstrap problems, and one of the one of one issue with the bootstrap is you you have to you do resampling, and there's a question of how much resampling should you do? Mm -hmm. And <coughs> there's an early paper by Brad Efron, I'd say early, it's probably mid-1980s. Um, and he argued in that paper that, so he, he basically came up with arguments for how many resamples you should take. And he, he, his argument for a bootstrap standard error was, led to a, um, something on the order of 50 or 100. Hmm. And, and he had another argument for bootstrap confidence intervals where he, um, he, his conclusion was you needed about 10 times that, like an order hmm. of magnitude more, right. like 1,000 or 2,000 resamples. But if you think about it, you know, what's the most, the most kind of naive confidence interval is the estimate plus or minus two standard errors. Right. Right? So why, sh you know, so why should the number of resamples for a standard error uh, be any different from the number of resamples for a, for a bootstrap confidence interval? Mm -hmm. It clearly doesn't make sense. Right. And the reason he came up with totally different answers is because he used totally different criteria for determining the sample size. Mm -hmm. So one was a, an unconditional criteria that took into, into account sampling variability in the actual data, as well as the, the resampling variability. Mm. Um, whereas his other argument only was based on the resampling variability. And my argument was that's the only relevant type of variability you need to consider here, because you want to, what you want to do is uh, minimize the amount of noise that you're adding to the actual data. And that noise is caused by the number of resamples. Mm. And so if you use that in both cases, you come up with roughly the same answer. So, mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, again, this was um, the reason people don't really think, think so much about these problems anymore because Computers are so much faster, mm -hmm. and so taking a thousand resamples is typically not a problem. But I don't know if you've heard of the double bootstrap. I have not. Okay, so or iterating bootstrap. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so this is another. So you, it, it's a technique that involves taking resamples, and then taking resamples from the resamples. So it's, mm. And so. Um, there's a question of how many resamples should you take and what's the balance between resamples and re-resamples. And early on, what people did is they used the same number. So they might use 300 resamples and then from each resample they took another 300. Hmm. And it turns out that the, no the number of resamples you take if you're, only, if you're only looking at coverage accuracy of confidence intervals, it doesn't really matter that much because it kind of averages out. The, the noise kind of averages out over the simulations. But um, anyway, so I, I wrote a paper with, with Peter Hall where we showed that 
the number of resamples at the second level should be roughly the square root of the number at the first level because first level, it turns out, contributes to variance and the second level contributes to bias and you have to balance those two. Mm. Um, again, um, I don't think people, anyone uses the double bootstrap anymore <laughs> because it's not, so the numbers we came up with is you roughly need about 2,000 first level samples and then 200 second level ones. So then, they, so you're talking about, um, was, was it 200 or 20? I don't remember, but you're talking about tens of thousands of resamples mm -hmm. in total. And it's just not feasible. To, nobody's gonna do that. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a theoretical exercise. It was a really interesting problem, but as a practical matter, it's, it hasn't had a, a huge impact. I don't think many people even know that result even now. Mm. And what has that kind of technological advancement been like through since from you said when you applied to uh, a PhD programs, you mentioned earlier that you had to go to the library, pick out a book, look at how to apply to yeah. these universities, and then now we have ChatGPT, which was released. Uh, earlier last year, or at, mm -hmm. towards the end of last year, um, you know, uh, just like that, how has the how have the technological innovations impacted the field of statistics from when you were first starting to modern day? So, <coughs> the, the first paper I, I ever wrote was on epidemic modeling, and I, for a particular epidemic model. I derived some recursive, a recursive algorithm for determining the limiting distribution of the epidemic. And so I wrote this paper, wrote down all the recursive algorithm formulas, and it was published in the Journal of Applied Probability. And I didn't do any computing at all. It didn't even occur to me to actually compute anything mm -hmm. until COVID happened. And I thought, wait a minute, I, I'd forgotten about this paper, but it, it turns out it was, a, it was about a carrier epidemic where people, you have the susceptibles and infectives and the infectives infect the susceptibles, but the, the ones who are infected split into two groups, ones who, um, who would who were carriers who don't have any symptoms, and then what we call notifications, people who had symptoms who were kind of removed, you know. So it, it actually was somewhat similar to the COVID situation. So I thought, I should, maybe I should go back and actually <laughs> compute something. Mm -hmm. so, so I programmed this in, first in R, <coughs> in R, and then in Python, and then in Julia. And what I figured out is that, um, it's, um, it just wasn't feasible to do the computations for a, a realistic population size yeah. because the, the, the computations grew exponentially with the size of the population. <coughs> and so, uh, and actually if you look back in the early the textbooks, I think Joe Garney, my advisor, uh, wrote one of these. He, um, he would do the, go through the recursive calculations for a population of say size three, mm. you know, because he could do the actual uh, oh, algebra for that. But, you know, with COVID, you want to do it for millions, you know. Right. Um, anyway, it turned out that um, there was a normal approximation you could use, so you didn't really need to <laughs> do the recursive calculations, but, but it does, you know, it does, you know, my experience when I first wrote the paper was, you know, it didn't even occur to me to do computations to now where I don't think you could publish anything without doing computations, you know. Right. And the, the capabilities have just changed so much mm -hmm. during that period. I don't think, you know, students coming into PhD programs now probably don't appreciate that. Right, mm -hmm. right. And yeah. 
and because of these technological advancements, there are things that come in and out of favor in the statistics world, mm -hmm. things that are now computationally feasible, so it, you know, now they get, get some attention, and things mm -hmm. that are uh, not so interesting anymore. And do you remember any of these sort of waves that you've seen in statistics, maybe like a wave of people doing biostatistics or Bayesian methods or MCMC uh, throughout your career? And then also, where do you think that <coughs> What direction do you feel like statistics is going in the next decade? Well, I definitely lived through the, the bootstrap wave, which kind of went through the 1980s. And then there was the MCMC wave, which was maybe the 1990s. Um, I think um, what's interesting is that, you know, the, the computing capabilities increase so fast that a lot of the things that people worked on became irrelevant, you know. Um, and I wonder if some of those things are going to happen, continue to happen, you know. Like you mentioned chat GPT. So I'm teaching linear models again this semester, and I thought, um, okay, well, let's put some of the problems into chat GPT and see what happens. And it, it will actually give you an answer, you know, but not necessarily a good answer, but, you know, there's one problem, uh, you know, I, I asked you to show that um, in a quadratic form that the matrix, you could assume the matrix in the middle was symmetric, mm -hmm. and, you know, why is that? Well, there's kind of a one-line proof. Uh, in chat GPT, it was like two pages long, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily wrong, but it was just way more than was necessary. But I told the students, you know, go ahead and use it. And just don't send me a two-page solution <laughs> for a one-line line answer. Yeah. So I, I, you know, and I, it'll only get better over time, and so it's hard to predict where that's going. Mm -hmm. But that, but it has been my experience to some extent that <clears throat> a lot of things people worked on specific, that were particularly computational became irrelevant over time. Okay. And uh, I guess, what advice would you give to someone who is just starting out in their career? You know, you think back to maybe yourself back in, back in the day, I guess, reaching for the book and <laughs> trying to apply to new programs. Uh, someone who's in that stage or maybe someone who's entering a, an assistant professorship, what advice do you give them to kind of be successful in, in their career as you have been? Well, I think for young assistant professors, I'm oh, sorry about this. No, you're good. Proper. Maybe you can drink some water <coughs> or something. Yeah, like it's no issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. For young assistant professors, an important um, bit of advice is to kind of get out there, go to conferences and, and put yourself out there, get to know other people who are working in the field and, you know, try to... Um, develop collaborations with um, other academics who are working on similar problems. Because it, you know, if you go to conferences, you get to know people, you get invited to give talks, and it, it's, it's a good way to promote your career. And, and eventually, you're going to need people to write letters for your promotion. And, you know, so, that, so that's an important um, bit of advice. Um, for people applying to graduate school, I would say, as I mentioned earlier, apply to a range, you know, maybe 10 different programs and aim at some of the top programs, but maybe some of the middling ones too, you know, um, just to give yourself a, the best chance of getting in somewhere anyway. Yeah, right. um, and then people who are maybe full professors or about to be full professors, I guess, what are some of the things that you look forward to now that you're a full professor and, and now that you're in a kind of an administrative role as well, at least for, the, for this mm -hmm. semester? Um, what are the things that you kind of enjoy about these roles? And also, the uh, kind of a side question is, how, did you, how are you balancing doing research and teaching classes and doing the administrative role? Um, 
probably not very well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I think with teaching, you know, you have to prepare and be ready to teach, you know, so that's something you can't really put off at all. Um, the administrative part can be kind of overwhelming um, at times. I, I was chair of a department for nine years, and I think it that had a kind of a detrimental effect on my research mm -hmm. productivity. But um, but there are you know there are good reasons to do that. Somebody has to do it, and and you know your role as a senior faculty member or as a, um, in a administrative role is to try and help younger people succeed and, and there's uh, you know there's something um, very rewarding about that I think but um, yeah it definitely <coughs> these administrative roles definitely have an impact on your ability to and the time you have to do research right and that's why um, we generally don't ask assistant professors to do that kind of thing. Um, and people tend to be more involved in administrative work the later, you know, as they progress through their careers. Hmm. And speaking of administrative roles, if someone wants to potentially go through the tenure track for a professor and then maybe become a chair or maybe even a dean or something, is there anything that they should focus on or any sort of advice or should they just make sure that their research is strong and their teaching is strong, just the fundamentals? Um, well, um, you know, one thing about being an administrator, particularly a department chair, is that you have to have some people skills and to be able to deal with you know, some sometimes kind of challenging interpersonal, you know, relationships. Um, and not everybody is good at that. And I'm not saying I was good at it, but it, it, was, it, it can be challenging. And some people are just not suited to it at all, and other people are, even if they're not, you don't have to be necessarily be a, a superstar researcher to be a very good administrator, so they're, they're not. Um, necessarily the same thing right. and then finally to to wrap up I guess looking back at your career so far you had this long successful career you know people things that me as an aspiring professor mm -hmm. at, at some point future professor I hope yeah. to eventually have a, a long strong career as well um, do you have any kind of favorite accomplishments or favorite moments and uh, what do you hope to kind of what are, what are kind of your thoughts about your future future in the field and what you're hoping to see? So, I, <coughs> in terms of my um, favorite accomplishments, I think um, the thing the things that I'm most proud of are the the students, especially the ones who've gone on to have successful academic careers. Um, and um, in terms of my, the, my future, um, to be honest, I'm probably going to retire in a few years. So. Mm -hmm. But one of the thing, projects I'm involved in right now, um, it's a, a life project that's quite important. And, I, and I'm um, hopeful that we'll be able to get some grant funding for it. It um, has to do with disease surveillance in free-ranging wildlife. So an example is um, chronic wasting disease in white-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's kind of spreading across the country and how do you monitor it? And um, so there's all kinds of uh, design issues, how do you sample and, and sample size do you need to, de to say, well, this county is disease-free and those kinds of things. But Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a group at the vet school here um, that's uh, very much invested in this whole topic. And so I, I got involved with them a couple of years ago. Joe Guinness is involved too um, because there's a big spatial component to it. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to 
bring in um, a substantial NSF grant. Mm -hmm. And that would be, uh, so in terms of immediate goals for me, that's, that's one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah, I hope that uh, works out for you. And that's kind of an interesting thing where mm -hmm. we apply statistics and maybe some fancy methods, but it's mm -hmm. nice to eventually get real applicable changes yeah. and things mm -hmm. that we can actually physically see. Um, mm -hmm. And things that are also relevant to other people in the sciences as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's really an interesting thing. Yeah. 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 Well, all right. Thanks so much, Dr. Okay. Wood. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.